You know, that's actually what I wanted to talk about today isn't so much the fitness industry on the business side being the supplement side, but more the fitness industry on the athlete side or the modeling side of the it. The influencer side. Yeah, sure. the, the social media influencer side of it. I uh, Especially, you know, a lot of people don't know Whitney's backstory, which is one of the things I want to jump into and kind of have you share that story because I thought it was super cool. Matter of fact, I think it's, you know, the way most people envision being discovered in the fitness industry is kind of the way it happened for you. But uh, to talk about that, to talk about the psychological aspect of it too, because anyone who's done it, who's gotten in great shape and then, you know, set the standard for themselves will tell you that it plays a lot of mind games with you. Mm -hmm. You guys are now tuned into the James Grage Theory, episode 11. And so this is the podcast where we talk about everything we just said. This is life, this is fitness, this is business, success, you name it. We're just going to shoot the shit today. Yep, so today's is kind of... Um, not really to focus on anything too specific, but I know there's a few things you guys want to really dive into. Something you guys talk about yeah. a lot, and it really has to do a lot with our fitness industry. Whether it's good, whether it's bad, most of it's pretty bad, some of it. Well, so. no, no, it's, it's not bad. It <laughs> most just, of it, it's pretty bad. Hold on. It just is what it is. It is what it is, and so I think we can, you know, just address it head on and talk about what it is. Uh, you know, there's definitely some pitfalls, I would say, in the fitness industry, and and they're hidden. Most people don't see them. And so I think we can have a pretty cool conversation and shed some light on it. But yeah, this one is definitely fitness related. Some of the other podcasts that we've done have been more focused on business and life and success. And uh, this is still about still about business. I mean, we're in yeah. the fitness industry uh, and it's definitely still about life. But this is more fitness oriented, the let fitness me, industry. Let me ask you guys. So we just had our New Year's in 2018. Do you guys like, I'll ask Whitney first, you'd like the way that the fitness industry is going in the direction. Let's talk specifically with, let's say, supplement industry. Do you like the way it's going? Are you trying to, I know we try to break the stigma on a lot of things and we try to do it the right way. Just generally, do you like the way it's going? There's some good and bad, right, with everything. With the supplement industry, it's, it's difficult. Obviously, I love what we're doing on our side of things. Um, there's a lot of innovation. There's, some, there's always new things, especially what we're doing here at BPI. But... The supplement industry in general, <clears throat> it's tough because there's always new companies popping up. There's always this underground group of guys that are coming up with stuff that aren't really, there's no, no regulation. So anybody can come up with that's, their own pre-workout powder that, and put it on the Let's say you got a lot of people chasing a buck. Yeah, yeah. And it's definitely changed over the years. I mean, even, God, I would say in the last three years, it's rapidly changed. And it's gone from an industry where you had aside of GNC and a vitamin shop, the corporate guys, you had a lot of the, you know, the local players that were in the, the mom and pop stores and those guys have disappeared. So everybody's chasing that Amazon dollar now. So it's completely different from a business aspect. Just like anything that's going digital. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think it's, you've seen the barriers of entry disappear. So now you're seeing a lot of people pop up in the industry. They're selling supplements online and on Amazon and you don't know anything about them or where they came from. And uh, so that's a little bit scary. I would say the one thing that, you know, we talk about a lot is, you know, knowing something about the brand, uh, you know, who they are, you know, what, what they their stand for. Yeah, what they stand for, what their values are. And I think that's a that's a big part of it. And too often you just hear these brands telling people what they want to hear, you know, that here's the secret, here's the shortcut. And I just don't think there's any integrity in that because... As Whitney will attest to, as anyone who's gotten any kind of results with anything in their life will attest to, yeah, there's a smarter way to do it, but you can't outsmart hard work. Yeah. It still takes hard work. And so to be the brand, to step up and tell people maybe the things that they don't want to hear, which is that, that it takes hard work, that it's not going to be tomorrow, it's not going to be fast, it's not going to be a four-week miracle transformation. Shortcut. Yeah, you know, take some integrity to tell people what they don't want to hear. But that's the right way to do it. And, uh, you know, that's everything that we've been talking about on this podcast is how to be successful in life or business or fitness. It's all the same. And, uh, you know, those are just core principles. Those are fundamental things. It takes hard work and consistency. And, you know, it takes these things. You got to be patient. It's not right. going to happen tomorrow. And I know 
one of the things that you both can attest to, and we talk about this a lot, is the consistency part of it. I mean, you guys can both walk around pretty much in your two weeks away from, I mean, dude, I've seen you in, in two weeks become, you know, if you look at the bodybuilding.com shoot issues where you can peel out at any moment. Same thing yeah. with James. You guys just have this power to reach, reach and touch it at any moment that you want. But that I think is a lot different than the way the fitness industry is conditioned, which is bulk, 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 get super skinny. Now you maintain that look for three days. Yeah, and that's, such, <laughs> and that's a lazy way. I forget who was talking about it earlier today, but we were having the conversation. The The lazy answer is, oh, I'm bulking right now. You know, I'm, I'm just getting big right now. I'm on right a 53-week bulk right you, now. Yeah, you've been on a bulk all year, so. <laughs> and successful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who says you're not successful with hey. your fitness goals? But no, I think that's the lazy way about it. And I can't even remember, uh, maybe back when I was in high school or, you know, shortly after that in college when I was on an intentional bulk you know, trying to add size. Uh, ever since then, it's just all been about fitness and being in shape and training hard. And I, I think a lot of people take the lazy way out and they say, well, you know, maybe I, I'll stay off of my diet or I won't watch what I eat. And I'm just going to tell everybody I'm bulking up and I'm going to try to bench 400 pounds, whatever it is. And, you know, that's not the, that's, that's not fitness. Right. You, you know, that's actually what I wanted to talk about today isn't so much the fitness industry on the business side being the supplement side, but more the fitness industry on the athlete side or the modeling side of the it. The influencer side. Yeah, sure. the, the social media influencer side of it. I uh, Especially, you know, a lot of people don't know Whitney's backstory, which is one of the things I want to jump into and kind of have you share that story because I thought it was super cool. Matter of fact, I think it's, you know, the way most people envision being discovered in the fitness industry is kind of the way it happened for you. But uh, to talk about that, to talk about the psychological aspect of it too, because anyone who's done it, who's gotten in great shape and then, you know, set the standard for themselves will tell you that it plays a lot of mind games with you. Mm -hmm. It's a real mind fuck. And, and I think that it can become really unhealthy and really out of balance. And so when we're talking about life balance or business success, all these different things we're talking about, when you first get into the fitness industry, it's really tough to find that balance or even define what success is anymore. You really kind of lose touch with it. I know I've gone through it. I know Whitney's gone through it. We've talked about it a lot. So I really want to kind of dive into that, which is like just the real side of it. You know, just, you know, women talk about this stuff and we've talked about that before that women are a little they're more okay making themselves vulnerable and talking about personal stuff and you know talking about body dysmorphia sure. issues things like that guys it's a little harder for us to be honest about it and just be like yeah i got body issues but it's a real thing yeah because we're not supposed to care right? yeah we're well you know we're not supposed to you know be that that sensitive yeah but uh so i want to talk about that but before we do I think it'd be cool to just hear your story of how you first got into it because, you know, for anyone that doesn't know, Whitney's been on more magazine covers than I can count. I mean, probably at least a dozen covers. You can, you can fill up this room more than you <laughs> Oh, yeah, can. yeah. I mean, I'm embarrassed to hang my pictures on the wall because, you know, Whitney could, you know, decorate the building. But, you know, from what? Muscle and Fitness, Fitness RX, Iron Man. Men's Health. Men's Health. That's a big one, too. Yeah. That's, that's not just fitness. That's, you know. But he also had kind of like the, the cliche, funny way to like to enter yeah, the and industry. It, and I, honestly, I, no joke, I think I was the last person to really get into the business this way. Because this was right before, uh, you know, this was before Facebook, right? So, like, right, I mean, Facebook was out, but I didn't have an account. And... Uh, so you're going back to 2006, 2007, somewhere around there. And um, a buddy of mine that I trained with was competing in the, uh, the USA's. And at the time, I owned a gym and I trained with him. And uh, so I wanted to be a bodybuilder, right? I didn't know any different. Mid-20s, wanted to get huge, compete and all this stuff. I fell in love with the industry. And then after training for about a year or so, I realized that I'm 6'2". I've got really long legs. I'm never going to get on stage. It's embarrassing, right? Even though I was lifting, you know, I was lifting just as heavy as any of these guys. My, I wasn't going to develop like that. I didn't have the structure right. to, to be a bodybuilder, and um, but you know, I was trying to figure out a way of, of staying in the industry because I loved it. I loved going to the shows and the expos and meeting these people and meeting the people that I read about for years. And um, I trained with uh, my my friend Curtis Bryant, who turned pro at the USA's that year. I trained with him 
for six months leading up to the show and I'd gotten in great shape. It's the first time that I'd really been in, in, you know, bodybuilding shape. I'd, I'd been lean before, but not like this. Uh, my abs were showing a full round look great. And, um, so I was out in Vegas for the show, hanging out by the pool and, uh, a photographer for one of the magazines saw me out there said, Hey, you look great. You want to, you want to take some pictures? And at first I thought, yeah, this is a little weird. Like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really into this. And he said, no, I'm serious. Let's get some test shots out here by the pool. And I'm going to send them over to the owner of the magazine who's here. And he'll probably look at him, want to have lunch with you tomorrow and, and set up a, a meeting for a shoot. I said, all right, what the heck? Let me do it. So we took some shots. Sure enough, the next day, the owner of the magazine came up to me and said, hey, let's have lunch. Let's talk about getting you out to L.A. for a photo shoot. And the next week, I flew out to L.A. and I shot my first cover with, with Pear, who was the best photographer in the industry. And um, Pear Bernal. Pear Bernal. And um, we got some great... Still shooting people. Yeah, still shooting. We got some great shots, and, and that ended up being a cover and had a great article in there. And I, I took that that cover and uh like i said this was before facebook i actually opened my facebook account shortly after and used that as my profile picture you know that was that was right when it kind of started social media and uh but i took that magazine and i mailed it to everyone i mailed it to i looked up in each magazine and got addresses and i mailed it to them you know now did you get a a brand new magazine to mail out or was it like a car did you copy it no 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 i i got magazines i got a whole box of magazines and i mailed them out and um, sent them to Iron Man, to Michael Nevue. I sent them to uh, the offices at Men's Health. Sent them to Muscle and Fitness. Sent it to everybody. And sure enough, they good started. Old, good old-fashioned social networking. Yeah, real networking. And, and these guys appreciated it. And they got back to me. And they said, hey, you look great. Let's, uh, let's schedule a shoot. And you know, that's kind of the start. You know, it's one of those things that no one really talks about in the fitness industry. But I've had people say, you know, why is it that everyone shows up to the big fitness shows, whether it's the Olympia Expo or the Arnold Expo, all these shows, everyone shows up, the spectators show up in great shape. But that's the dream. That's why. It's the dream that I'm gonna show up to the show, I'm gonna be in great shape, that someone's gonna take notice, that I'm gonna be discovered, and that's how my fitness career is gonna start. And that's how it used to be. Obviously, social media has changed all that, but I gotta say that there's still something cool about being on a magazine cover. You can take a magazine cover, you can frame it, you can hang it on it, your wall, and it's gonna last forever. You could take your best YouTube video with you know 10 million views, what are you gonna print it? Right. You know, are you gonna hang it on your wall? It's, it's just, there's something to it that's tangible, and that's why I think that even though magazines aren't what they used to be, there's still something cool about it. It's still an awesome It's something like mm-hmm. crystallizing that moment, I think, you know? Well, and it's still something that's seen by everybody like you know there's something about when you walk into an airport in you know new york or la or wherever you're at and you see this cover sitting on the newsstands and everybody who walks by sees that there's something cool if you go buy a copy of your own magazine which i know you've done i know i've done yeah and you walk up to the cash register and you kind of like put up there like (laughs) you know no big deal and they're like oh my god is that you you know that's cool well so let's that's a perfect transition into kind of some of the topics one more thing one more thing (laughs) you got a story like that don't you yeah i do I can't remember the TV show, but it was a show that used to come on HBO. I, I forget what, uh, I can't think of the name of it. But um, this was after one of the, maybe it was Fitness RX. I don't know what cover it was. But in one of the episodes, somebody picked up a magazine and they were reading it and it was my cover. And I didn't see the episode, but somebody took a screenshot and sent it over to me. And it's like, holy shit, like that's that's, that's pretty cool. cool. But and that's not going to happen with a YouTube video, right? Yeah, exactly. No, but what you were saying was, so the experience of you grabbing your magazine, walking up to the counter, and the person saying, "Damn, is that you?" And we've talked about this before. Now, I've, both of you, I've seen both of you guys prepare for this one-day shoot where you're going to look like that for three days mm-hmm. out of the whole year. Most people. So, and we've we've discussed this a lot, and this is kind of part of the conversation. Yeah. Was you'll see one of these athletes, India, anybody that that we know. They get super prepared for this one shoot. They shoot a thousand pictures, and now those pictures. Are for the next six months they'll use yeah. them, and, and that's that's a trap. And yeah, we definitely should talk about. It. But remind me at the end to bring it back full circle because I know my mindset has changed about that, and even with recent shoots about the condition that I've come into these shoots with. Because I think there's a responsibility to project an image that is more realistic, or at least be honest about it. If it's a crazy condition that you can only hold for 24 hours, well then talk about it and talk about all the crazy things that you had to do to get in that kind of shape. But I know but, you guys have friends that you've seen magazine covers that you're like, 
He doesn't well, look like well, that. Well, anything like well, that. You, yeah. you even had that experience. Yeah, that's, that's that was your we, first magazine that's cover, what wasn't we were it? talking about last week. So, and that was heartbreaking, and that really was. Like, well, tell, tell the story. Tell, then. Yeah, it was the first time I, ex- I experienced this, like, you know, this uh, the letdown after a shoot. So, this was uh, after that first shoot. It was for Fitness RX, and because you dieted for what six months leading yeah, up yeah, to it. Yeah, I dieted for months for this because I didn't know when the shoot was going to be, and I was just like holding on. And then you know, the magazine comes out. And after the after the shoot was over, I did like what any you know bodybuilder would, you know, and they kind of get off their diet, cut and, loose. Yeah, and all of a sudden you're back to normal. You're living a normal life. Snap back. On, yeah, I put on not a lot, but maybe 15 pounds or so. And there's a big difference from like 210 and shredded and 225 and just like you look like you go to the gym. And um, so the magazine had just come out, and I went to uh, this Mexican restaurant back home. It's a place I'd go to every week and. Um, I was so excited to show the waiter who I talked to all the time. I had the magazine. It just it just gone on shelves, and I had it in my hand, and I showed it to him. I was like, hey, check it out. And he looked at it. It was like, oh, cool. I was like, no, that's me on the cover. He was like, get out of here. Yeah, right. That's not you. I'm like thinking to myself, do I not look like this guy anymore? And that's a terrible feeling. <laughs> and really I, think, I think that's a good lead into what we're talking about today, which is the standard that you feel obligated to hold yourself to all the time. And that's where the mind games start to come in because the first time you get in really, really good shape, it's this goal and you'll just be happy to even get close to that goal. But then once you get there, then you feel like anything less is substandard. And that's where you see people posting these pictures on social media from these photo shoots. It's not just because they're trying to deceive people. It's because this mental game where you're telling yourself, I don't want to post a picture of myself showing anything less than that. If my abs aren't crispy, you know, sharp, then I don't want to post the picture. And that's where the head game comes in. And you start to feel like anything less that you're out of shape. And anyone else is going to look at you and say, man, what the hell is wrong with you? You got like some serious issues. I would die to look that way. That's, that's my goal. Yep. But I think that also comes from you know, several years and decades of you guys kind of living that, understanding it. I know no, it no, wasn't no, but, all but, that. But, but it can happen quick, and that's my Absolutely. point. That moment right there it, sitting at the table showing the waiter the magazine cover and having the person say, nah, come on, that's not you, and then realizing, oh, wait a second, you know, he doesn't think that's me because he doesn't think I'm in that good a shape. Yeah, it was a crushing blow to my ego. And <laughs> and immediately, it's and it started back then, and that's when, you know, that's when things got, it, it could have spiraled downhill really quick. Cause I'm thinking to myself like, oh my God, am I fat? Like, what am I terrible shape? And, and you and you sound like what like, you know, guys don't talk like that. And that's mm-hmm. like a that's a dark place for anyone to go. And I think a lot of people go there. And I think a whole lot more people than we realize. I think a lot of people that we see on social media that have huge followings and you and you you know kind of follow along their life and you think you know them. I think a lot of people experience that. But you guys really know some of these people, and you know yeah. they're absolutely unhappy. Oh, totally. Yeah, there's a lot of them. I mean, we saw a lot of this, too, with Instagram. So you saw, to, saw a lot of Instagram celebrities who didn't want to make the transition over into any of the live content or into YouTube content because it's hard to create that same illusion when you're doing weekly content. Yeah. With Instagram, you can create whatever kind of illusion you want. You know, it's it's a big show, it's a facade, but when people see you every day or every week, they know whether you're in shape or not. And so you're starting to see more transparency in that. And now finally people are starting to come out and say, look, okay, here's the real deal. And and that's that's all I'm hoping for is that we see more of that because that's the only thing that I don't like is that dishonesty. And again, it's not that they're trying to intentionally deceive anyone. It's just coming from an insecurity. It's coming from a really negative place. But the problem is people are looking at this and saying, okay, if this guy can do it, if he can be ripped and shredded 24-7, 365, then what the hell is wrong with me? Because I can't. And it's the same thing with you know the transformation plans. Wait a second, I've been training for three months now. I've done my 12-week transformation. I dieted, I trained, I did my cardio, and I don't look that way what's wrong with me and that's where i feel like there's a responsibility for people to be more honest about it and just talk about it you know that's again going back to even what we're talking about with integrity as a company that you know yeah would i love to sell people protein powders and bcas and everything else yeah but the reality is that supplements probably only play 10 percent if that 
when it comes to getting results. It's training, it's nutrition, and more importantly, it's consistency and hard work with both of those. And it just happens over a long period of time. And so supplements, yeah, they can play a part in there. They're gonna help you with your recovery. Protein powder I see more as a food item Mm -hmm. than I do supplements. So that definitely helps. Definitely helps break up the monotony of eating chicken breast and steak and you know the same thing over and over. But yeah, they can accelerate results. I think they can, you know, get you uh, help enhance your results, but they're not going to be some sort of miracle, you know. So anyone who's taking a fat burner and saying, you know, hey, what happened? The miracle pill. The miracle pill. No there's such no, thing. There's no miracles. So, but let me ask you guys from another point of view because go ahead. What, what were you? No, gonna I was going to say. Do you think that uh, a lot of the people that that will post, like let's say, they're in shape pictures all the time, mm. and it's a fear. Uh, not only letting people down, like they don't want people to look at look at you and think, oh, well, this guy isn't really in shape all the time. It's to more or less for, so they don't get caught. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't, they I don't, don't get, they don't I expose don't, themselves. Like, maybe I don't believe that I am in, you know, the the best at this or whatever it is. So I'm going to post these pictures that of me when I was. I, I, in I, great I think shape. it's. I think it's definitely a fear of rejection. Yeah. I think that you know it's easy to seek acceptance in general but especially on social media and it's so easy for people to reject you on social media that yeah i think that you know it's a always a fear of being exposed dennis and i had a cool conversation we're talking about ego and you know when you have that fear deep down inside that i'm going to be found out like i'm trying to project something that's not true this image of who i am you don't want to be a fraud i don't want to be a fraud and i don't want to be caught right? right And so I think a lot of people are trying to project something and it's not, again, that they're trying to deceive anyone or trying to be a fraud, but it's coming from, again, insecurity. So they're trying to project something that's not necessarily true. And then, yeah, there's always going to be that fear of I'm going to be found out. Yep. Do you think there also something plays in the part of you're an online trainer, let's say, and, you know, they don't want you to see any, you have a thousand clients. We know a bunch of people that have, you know, thousands of clients online. And we know for a fact they don't look great at all times. But right. to their projection, they have to give to their well, For their see, business. Clients. See, but that's yeah. the thing that I want to address. I think that you just have to redefine what great looks like because that's where I'm at in my life. I don't, I don't hold myself to that same standard because I don't even think that that's, one, it's not even sustainable. Two, I don't even think it looks as great as I used to. Like, to me, it just... It got so skewed. It became about, you know, like what kind of separation and vascularity and, you know, how grainy right. could I get? How dry could and I that's get? Not fitness. It doesn't even look good, no. really. It looks, it looks awesome. Impressive. Like it, it looks impressive, right? Yeah. You know, you equate that with really hard work. Uh, but it's an extreme. And, uh, you know, to me, I'm at a point now where I would rather have better balance, feel better about how I look not feel like I'm trying to keep up, you know, this illusion, Mm -hmm. just be real about it. And so this last photo shoot that I did, I was in okay shape, you know, compared to like past standard. I didn't feel like I was, you know, embarrassed to get in front of the camera, but I certainly wasn't ripped or shredded. Right. But, you know, I was honest about it. But you aren't ripped or shredded in your standards. Yeah. But if anybody else saw you, especially outside of the fitness world, they're going to they're not going to think twice. They're they're really they're not going to look at that cover and look at the shoot that you just did and think any different. Right. right? Yeah, but wait, you're, you're you're more guilty than oh, I'm the that, worst. than anyone. Cuz I'll be like, "Hey, come do a video with me." He's like, "Dude, I can't." Like the, this, this, I'm the give, worst. Me, give me two weeks. Yeah. This guy just here recently because he was going to shoot as well. So when I did the, this cover uh, recent cover shoot Whitney was going to shoot with him as well a different day and couldn't do it because just had a baby, Mm -hmm. which congratulations again. So that's why he didn't do the shoot. But he was like, ah, you know, I just kind of been sidetracked with a lot of stuff, really not in great shape. I saw a picture of this dude (laughs) in his abs. I'm like, I hate you. Like, what's wrong with you? Crazy. Crazy. Like his out of shape is still. And that's the point is that's where the body dysmorphia comes in what we see in our head is just all out of whack yeah let me ask you guys a question because i think you've both had the extreme i think james had an extreme version of it but you also have to deal with it on your own when you can't work out when you're physically injured and you are at this adonis body state at certain point Mm -hmm. looking like a god and then 
it was all taken away from you. Just recently, I think Whitney, you know, Whitney snapped his ankle everywhere. And he was, <laughs> he's a different animal because he was back in two months, just like, you know what? Fuck this deadlifts. Um, but, but how, how do you deal with that mentally when it comes to like, let's say you have that dysmorphia, but now you really are paralyzed basically. I can tell you from my experience and when it happened to me, I wasn't as far along in, you know, this, this journey of figuring out who I was. And How so old I, were you? Uh, I was in my, my mid twenties. Okay. And, uh, so I didn't have that same kind of true self-confidence as in being just, you know, really comfortable in my own skin of who I was. Uh, and I just didn't have a lot going for me. So the one thing that I did have going for me obviously was being in shape and being known for that. And I didn't realize how much of my identity was that, right. was being that guy who was in shape. And so when I came out of the hospital and I went from you know 195 down to 139 after you know seeing the hospital that long, I, you know, here I was a skinny little guy, just broken, walking around on a, a walker. And it was just like, I felt like I didn't even know who I was anymore. I felt like I had no identity. And uh, so that was a real eye opener for me. One, at first, you know, I have to be honest about it and say that was a lot of my motivation to build myself back because it was the only thing that I had mm-hmm. at the time. And it was, and what I later came to realize that was my foundation and became more and more my foundation as time went on, learned more principles about building success through fitness. And so it is a cornerstone for me. But yeah, going through that uh, and losing that. And just being like, you know, an average guy or worse than, you know, any, any guy on the street looked better than I did. Right. I mean, it was, it was terrible. Had, Cause you had just competed right before you got hurt, right? Literally a month before my car accident, I had just competed. Yeah. And you get out of the hospital and you tell someone, Hey, I just won this show a couple months ago, whatever it was, nobody would have believed you. No. So that's a tough man. That's, it was, it was tough. And matter of fact, uh, once I got out of the Walker, then I ended up with a cane and I had that cane, I want to say probably for a good. I don't know, eight months. And probably the last month or two, I should have gotten rid of it, but I didn't. And it literally was a crutch for me. Yeah. You know, you hear people talk about something being a crutch, and it was a crutch. I was afraid to get rid of the cane because, at least with the cane, people knew that there was something wrong with me, and that's why I looked the way I looked. Right. To get rid of it, then I just looked like some skinny little guy that didn't work out. That didn't work out. Oh, man, that's tough. What about yeah. you, Whit? Kind of dealing with not at the extreme level, but yeah, n- you know there was uh, nothing even close to what James went through. But still, I mean, injuries are injuries. That it all they all suck, and that's the first time this past summer when uh, when I when I broke my ankle. That was the first week of June, and that's the first time that I've taken that much time off of the gym, ever. I mean, I I, I mean it was from I think the first week of June, and I didn't really get back into the gym until late August mm-hmm. I had a couple workouts here and there I would take the scooter back there and do some stuff but the only thing I could do were like tricep push downs and some cable curls and stuff I couldn't really do anything but um no it's 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 tough to deal with that especially in the, the mental aspect of training and why I train it's a it's a stress relief you know it's it's what I do daily and that's taken away from me for some you time lift heavy dude yeah and I like to train heavy um not that that's always a good thing but uh, you know, having that taken away, it humbles you and it makes you appreciate when, you know, what you have. And I, I remember sitting there and talking to you about it that day, thinking like, hey, this is just a, a little minor injury in a couple months. I'll be back to, you know, back to 100 percent and forget that this even happened. But it makes you think like, you know, I, I have to be grateful that I can go to the gym every day and I don't have some serious in- injury that, that would keep me out of the gym permanently. Yeah. Yeah, you know, walking up, walking up and down the steps, you know, that's a that was a win for me when I could first walk up the steps without like sitting down and going using my butt each step. You know, that was a win. So once you you know, once you heal from that, it's like, all right, I'm not going to take that shit for granted anymore. Yeah. Humbling is a good word. I think that was one thing that uh, definitely uh, came from it for me was it humbled me big time because mm-hmm. I was cocky. Right. Oh. Uh, yeah, come on, you know. 25, you're ripped, you're yeah. good looking dude. Like, I've yeah, got no, no, it was, you know, it was definitely a humbling experience, especially imagine this, you know. Imagine laying in a bed with casts on both arms, both legs broken, broken hips, so laying there immobilized and then realizing for the first time 
that you got a shit in a bedpan and someone else Ugh. is going to come wipe your ass. It may not sound like a big deal. It's a big deal. <laughs> like that's humbling. <laughs> Do you that's think humbling. you had a uh, like a, a the the fear of 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 dying? I mean, did that did that cross? Did, uh, not that you were going to, but like. I've heard other people explain that there's like certain moments when their life changes and when you have a wreck like that, you don't know what's going to happen to you. Did you, did it, did it cross your mind? Like I need to do everything that I want to do because this could all be taken away instantly. Just like that. Yeah, if I you mean, you're lucky to, to get, if you listen this. to the last episode, one yeah. of the things I'm just going to quickly, but there was a certain point after, after speaking with his friend, George, that was like a, a light switch right. turn. That was like kind of the, the way I see it. Yeah. yeah I mean, look when it, so before we had that split second before I hit the truck, yeah, I said my goodbyes. Right. Oh yeah, because I mean, look, I was I was speeding. The truck coming towards me was huge truck. I was in a tiny little sports car. He was speeding. Yeah, it was. It was one of those things. I just thought I was a goner. So I said my you know millisecond goodbye. It's been a good life. See you later. Sayonara. And I, you know, I got to tell you though because. I was young and I was selfish and I didn't have anything going on. I really was, and it, I didn't care, I guess, because right. I didn't have anything to lose. You know, that's why you hear, you know, these stories of, you know, you know, what is it, live hard, die young, right. or whatever that saying is. I mean, live fast, die young. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he just, you know, that's that's how I lived my life, and I. Uh, so I was never scared of dying. I was never scared of getting hurt. I was crazy when I was younger. Just always doing something that was you know jumping off or diving off bridges right. or just doing crazy dumb stuff because i just wasn't afraid of the repercussions i uh, but after that accident i realized that you know that cliche saying that you know it can change in an instant that you know you don't know what tomorrow holds i realized wait a second that really is true. Matter of fact, I've come to realize that all cliche sayings when it comes to motivation, they're all true. They're all- you want to know what the secrets are? They're not secrets. They're cliche sayings. They're, you know, like all yeah. those motivational posters that you see on the wall. They're all true. You just have to believe in them. Do you think that you got a second chance? Do you think that, do you look at it that way that like, all right, I've got a chance to do something now? That's actually, so that's, that's probably closer to the truth. It wasn't like this, you know, miracle aha moment. I felt like I had some sort of weird responsibility. I felt like for whatever reason, which I couldn't figure out why I was given a second chance because even the trauma surgeon who did the initial assessment when I came in on the life flight helicopter, I uh, told my mom, you know, she said something about, I guess I was lucky. And he said, look, I'm not a religious person. He's like, but this guy should have been dead four times over. He's like, he's here for a reason. Wow. And so, that really weighed on me. It kind of troubled me, to be honest with you. I'm like, well, what, yeah. what, what's this reason? Why? why? <laughs> and so I felt that it was irresponsible to waste the opportunity. You know, if I've been given a chance to, you know, do something with my life, well, then let me do something with it. And, you know, that's all. That's just a decision. You don't have to have a life-threatening crash to make that same decision. And I know to some people it seems like a big deal. Like, how do you get to that point? No, it's just saying, okay, I'm going to do it. And right. it's like, it is like flicking a light switch on or off. And so as soon as I made that decision, it was kind of instantaneous. Like I said it to Dennis last week. I just told myself, I'm tired of fucking around. Like it's been fun, been dicking off, but it's time to do something. Right. Now. Wow. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions from here. My buddy here, Turkish, Merhaba, which means hi in Turkish. What's up? Um, here's a very short question. No. No. Something about pain. No. I'm going to stay away from that. What, somebody here asked, Jonathan M81, is it ever too late to start? No. Never. No. <laughs> Never. Never too late. Say, so, well, what are some of the, the couple tips you would get to somebody? Maybe, let's say he's an older gentleman couple things he wants to maybe to get to get started well, it's what james just said you just have to flip the switch and go i mean that's that's how you start right yep it, it, there's no secret just like we just talked about there's no secret you just have to do it look life is life is just decisions that's all it is our life is a byproduct of the decisions we make and unfortunately we're just not always aware of the decisions we make or why we make the decisions we make you know there's a lot of decisions we make consciously during the day 
and those are the ones that we're aware of. And you know, someone says, hey, what were the hard decisions you had to make today? And you might name two or three, but your entire day from the moment you wake up, even when you wake up or how you wake up, mm -hmm. right? The decision, do I sleep in? Do I get up early? Do I hit the snooze bar? That's a decision. You know, what kind of mood am I gonna wake up? That's a decision. And you know, people get really locked into like, well, I don't really have control over the way I feel. No, I think that's kind of bullshit. I think we absolutely have control over the way we feel. When we're down about something, it's usually because of whatever we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. And we get, you know, if you feel negative and you get in a rut, that's because we're usually locked into negative thinking at the time. And so you think about negative shit, yeah, you're gonna feel down. And it's as simple as making a decision, saying, hey, I'm gonna change my focus. I'm gonna start focusing on things that are more productive and things that make me happy. And so life is all decisions, but if you're not aware of the decisions you're make, making, then yeah, you're gonna be kind of like this autopilot person walking around, you know, feeling like you're just a victim of life. But I don't believe in that. I, I believe that we have control over everything in our life. Subconsciously, you're gonna make the decisions whether, you, like you said, you, do, you don't even know you're making the decision, but you're going to make the decisions that are comfortable for you because you're, you, have feel, you're, you, you have fear of failure, rejection, whatever it is. So you're going to continuously, subconsciously make those, those decisions throughout the day. You have to like decide, to this is what I'm going to do. A lot of people, unfortunately, you're right. They make the decision to avoid discomfort. Right. All their decisions are, are about that, making it easier, making it less painful or less uncomfortable. And that's why that's one of the best lessons I think I ever learned in the gym because it's one of those places or, you know, it's an environment where that's what you're chasing. Mm -hmm. You're chasing uncomfortable. You're chasing pain. You're chasing the burn. We love that. You love it and you embrace it. And once you embrace it, that's I think that's the changing point for people in the gym from I don't like it, like it's uncomfortable, it's pain or I'm sore to I love it. It's when you can embrace being uncomfortable and realize that results come from that. Do you think that you, because I enjoy that feeling, and it's a special feeling when you're training and all of a sudden the blood's pumping and it's, your, your arms are warm and you feel good. You can feel the muscle working. I love that feeling. I love it when you, know, you can't get another rep, right? Do you think that, because you also have that, th the same mentality, do you think it's because we started training so young and we've been doing this for 20 yeah, some years? Yeah, because explain that to me because, because you know, he talks about this, this <laughs> burning, enjoy it. <laughs> this, this painful, you know, cramping, and James like, yeah, fuck yeah, but I'm like, I love it. I don't no, enjoy no, it. I, I, I think it's the association that we create. I, you know, the things that we dislike in the world is because we have a negative association with it. And I just have a positive association with that pain. I equate that pain with results. And I have to remind myself of that in other aspects of my life because there's parts of like even business that, that I hate and that I used to struggle with. BPI is not the first business that, uh, that I started. I had other business ventures that I tried and I always loved the new. Right. Starting something, it's new, and it's exciting and all these ideas. And, and then it gets to the point where you realize you just got to do the work and it's a drag and it can be boring. And it's just the, it's the grind that they talk about. And that was the part that I hated. And so when it got to be a grind, I didn't want to do it anymore. So it wasn't until I could kind of bridge that gap between, you know, what I learned in the gym and apply that into business and say, okay, it's the same thing. Like I've got to embrace the the uncomfortable yeah. and the grind is uncomfortable. I mean, that listen to the word right there, the grind. It's it, that hard friction. It's right. that. Well, some and sometimes it, you know, and, and look, I hate the word now because Instagram people have made it so cliche. It pisses me off because things that are so What's true. That grind the grind. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm like, ah, oh, come on. You know, it's like, can it be a grind? Yeah, but you know what? It's you can enjoy the grind, mm -hmm. but you just have to change your association because I used to have a really negative association with that grind, that hard work, the boring, all that in business. And that's that's why I had an aversion to it. And that's why I wanted to run away from it screaming. Right. And go do something else new that was fun and exciting. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had to learn that, you know, uncomfortable is where results happen. And so do I necessarily love the burn? No, I mean, if, look, if I were to really break it down, if I were to strip out that positive association with it, then yeah, I would see it the same way you do, which is sometimes it fucking hurts. It hurts. hurts. Yeah. It hurts. Um, I have a question for Whitney. So we've done our previous nine episodes and we talked about a lot of things. One of the things I think we talked about maybe two weeks ago was how to fit fitness into your, into your lifestyle. And I think it was just something that I struggle with. I feel I'm doing okay at work. My life's okay. I just can't 
comfortably. And that was the conversation with James was, if you're going to force it into something that you're not going to be able to do, yep. you're going to set yourself well, up for failure. Basically what I was saying is that if you try to, you know, because everyone on Instagram and everyone out there that's preaching a fitness lifestyle, look, you know how it started. It, it was this ripple effect, like the pebble in the pond. It started with this bodybuilding subculture and the way we talk, the way we train, the way we diet, and it started radiating outward. And now it's all the way out here, but it's perpetuated through Instagram and people talking about this lifestyle. Right. And so people from the outside looking in thinking, oh my God, if I want to get in shape, I've got to make all these sacrifices. I can't hang out with my friends anymore. A gallon of jugs, six, I got, yeah. six prepared meals, six tubs of, and, and of it's, wear. It's and not that. Look, and if you want extreme results, do you have to take extreme actions? Absolutely. But if you just want to be in shape, you don't have to live that way. And I think that if you're trying to cram that square peg into a round hole, and disrupt someone's entire lifestyle for the person who doesn't want extreme results, it's not gonna work for them. Nope, not gonna work. It's just like when you're on a diet, right? And I used to tell people this all the time, I hate fish. Mm. And if I had somebody that was gonna write a diet for me to get in shape, right? And they put fish every single meal. You weren't gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it, I'm gonna fail. So if, you know, cramming a certain fitness lifestyle onto someone that doesn't live that way, doesn't enjoy it, or, or Maybe, doesn't want the extreme results. Yeah, they don't want those results. They're going to, you know, a couple of weeks and they're gone, right? That's a, look, it's the same thing with business too or any pursuit. It really depends on how far you want to take it. That's the first question I have for people is like, what kind of results do you want? Do you want to take it to the max? You want to take it to the limit? Well, that's an extreme. It's an extreme. It's going to require extreme action, extreme discipline, extreme everything to get there. If you just kind of want some results and you want balance in your life, well, balance doesn't fit into extreme results. Same thing in business. Look at the most successful people in the planet. They're not balanced people. I'm sorry, they're not. Right. It's extreme. Mm -hmm. And it requires extreme sacrifice a lot of the time. So, and we've lived that way. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't much of a sacrifice to me. Like the social life wasn't a big sacrifice because I'm not a real social person. I don't like hanging around a lot of people. The food wasn't a big sacrifice for me because I'm not a foodie. I really don't care. I mean, I could eat the same thing every day and it just, it wouldn't bother me because I don't derive satisfaction from food. It's just not my thing. Right. So most of the sacrifices that a lot of people have a hard time making when it comes to fitness weren't as hard for me. So if anything, if I felt like I had an easier time with it, it wasn't because I had better genetics. It was because those sacrifices weren't as hard for me. Yeah, someone like you, though, wait, I could say, you know, you have every excuse in the world not to go into the gym and, and do, you know, you just had a right. kid, had the wife and everything. And But a couple months ago, let's say, you know, a year ago, mm -hmm. you were in a completely diff different position. Totally. I'd say fitness was maybe number two on your list of after work. Yeah, it was work, fitness. fitness. Yeah, and then the everything else was. Yep. And everything is so tied together as far as How do you my fit it in right fitness? now, right? everything is intertwined it is it is such a huge part of my life and that's that's how i'm able to continue to train the way that i do and do what i do because it is a part of my life right and it's not not saying that it's easy but i'm gonna take an hour every day to work out like it doesn't matter what's going on i mean unless there's some catastrophe right i'm gonna train i do have the the little setup in my garage now so that definitely helps especially you now with the baby so i can just go out in the garage and train and at least get something done but i i'm gonna train every day you know, someone said something to me once, this was, uh, you know, 10 years ago, and it really stuck with me. And they said that fitness was the common thread that ran through their life, that through all the ups and all the downs, all the unknowns, that fitness going into the gym was that one thing that always stayed the same and that it was their anchor. Mm -hmm. And Whitney and I have been doing it long enough to where it's the same way. It's that anchor. And I, th I think that if we stopped going to the gym at this point, it would feel like what's going to hold us down? What's going to anchor us anymore? Right. I mean, you know, I feel like whole life would probably, you know, like blow away, especially since the discipline. And I think Whitney and I share a lot of the same mindset when it comes to discipline and just what it takes to get results, not just in the gym, but with anything. Because you got the same work ethic mm -hmm. when it comes to business. I, without the gym, I'd feel like a lot of things would unravel. That is, it's almost like, it's not just the way I exercise my body, it's the way I exercise those mental disciplines. Yeah, when you have everything 
everything's clicking, right? Your training's good. You've been eating the way you should. And I'm not saying on a super strict diet, calorie deficient. Yeah. I'm just saying you're eating properly. You're training. If you're doing your cardio, if you like to do cardio, you're doing your cardio regularly. Everything else seems to kind of fall in place. Yeah. It always has for me. Yeah, and you need that. I mean, look, we've talked about this before, but getting results, you have to be very programmatic like we talked about. And for me, that was my weakness. When I was young, I didn't want any kind of consistency. I didn't have any kind of discipline. I was off running, doing this and that and the next thing. And I never stuck to one thing long enough to ever get really good results. You know, whether it was sports, I would play, you know, one year, be really good for one year, and then that was it. No commitment to it. No commitment yeah. to it. I didn't have any commitment didn't to, to be tied anything, down to anything, right? To anything. I didn't want to be tied down to a place or anything. I would just pick up and I would move. And so that was fun. I had a lot of adventure, but it was also the one thing that was holding me back from actually having any real success. And that was even with this business now going into what, getting close to nine years now with BPI. It's the first time that I really said, okay, I'm going to settle in. I'm going to settle in. I'm going to be focused. I'm going to be disciplined and I'm going to stay the course and I'm going to grind this thing out. And I was at that point in my life where I did the same thing with my relationship, did the same thing as a parent, just like, all right, I'm going to settle in. And I learned that you just have to do the same thing every single day. And that's where we talk about routine. Mm -hmm. And you can't underestimate the importance of routine. And to me, a routine isn't just doing one thing like, okay, I'm going to fit fitness into my, my day. No, it's got to be like from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed it's almost like a set sequence. Like I wake up, I have my egg whites, I have my oatmeal. Yep. And it's like everything becomes very, very structured and fitness is just part of this whole. It's not by itself. Mm -hmm. And so if you disrupt any one of those things, it makes it really difficult. And that's why like everything that you went through here recently, mm -hmm. I was kind of curious to see how you would navigate someone so committed to fitness to one going from being single, right? no obligation to anybody, yep. To all of a sudden going into a relationship, moving in together, mm -hmm. having a baby together. Right. Like those are major changes. And most people, I think at that point, that's where they find themselves thrown off. Like when you disrupt one, especially two things, but you're talking about like major things. And I had the injury in the middle. And mm -hmm. you had the injury. Right. How right. did you deal with, like, can you give us come, just some people, because over here, some people are like, holy shit, dude. That's why we call it dad bod, because all the stresses of the dad yeah, life right. become. But how do you... How do you personally, some of the tips that you can give maybe these guys, say, don't give excuses? How, how did you well, deal with that? Actually, even before you it? get to this solution, was there a point where when you were in the midst of all this change, was there some sort of like point where you felt like you might have stalled a little where it got to you? You took off bit. your shirt one day and you're like, Oh, abso hey. absolutely. Absolutely. And it was right. It was shortly after I broke my leg and we had just moved. And um, uh, <laughs> all of our, our bedrooms. And he moved. Yeah. The whole all, house. all of our bedrooms and our bathrooms are upstairs. The showers are upstairs. And I'm downstairs with the cast on and in pain. And I couldn't even get upstairs to take a shower. This is like three days in. Yeah. A few days in. I just moved in. And everything from my old condo and a lot of stuff from her place. It was all in the garage, and it was just a mess. I, and I'm, I'm organized. I like to know where everything is in my house. I like to be able to get to stuff, easy access. I couldn't get to anything. I didn't even know where my clothes were. I'd had like maybe like three pairs of shorts and a couple of T-shirts that I could get to. And it was a mess. And, like, and I thought for a couple of days, like, damn, I'm not gonna, how am I going to get this back together? Like, what am I going to do? And that's when I decided to put the gym in the garage. I said, as soon as I can get this fucking garage cleaned up, I'm going to put a gym in here. I'm never going to have an excuse. I can go outside and train at midnight. I don't care. I'm going to work out. And, um, and like you were saying, that, 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 that common thread, that it is the gym for me. That's what keeps everything stable in my life. You know, it's funny. Whit and I had a conversation about it. And I told him, I said, I have zero doubt. I think you yeah. remember we are in the gym. I had zero doubt that Whitney would be able to navigate all these hurdles, the, the lifestyle changes, all this stuff because he's committed to it. It's a priority to him. And that's what we always talk about, right? Is how high of a priority is it to you? Fitness is always gonna be a priority to him. Just like it's always gonna be a priority to me because I make it a priority. And I've come to appreciate it as not just you know a way to stay in shape or to look good or to feel good, but it's for my mental sanity, mm -hmm. right? It's a stress relief, but it's also, 
it's that cornerstone. It's it what holds everything together. And I think you made a great point a, about about the Whitney thing because you know I'm here, and Whitney's like a like a what with whatever he does, he's kind of like a high level athlete. And even with this, you know, like Michael Jordan's going to make that last shot. It's <laughs> like you knew Whitney was going to do it. I was just like you yourself. I was curious about how he was going to. Well, I was more keep curious. Throwing in more stuff, he keeps juggling more. I was more know, curious like the, about uh, the mental the MJ reference. Right. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty flattering. <laughs> no, I was curious about the mental process because as, as as many tools as I have at my disposal to keep myself motivated on track, I still have my low points where where stuff gets to me and I just feel blah and down. Oh, yeah. And so uh, that's what I'm always curious about. And I think that's the thing that people can relate to the most is, all right, so when you reach that point where you just feel like shit and it just doesn't feel like anything's going your way, it's like, what is that process where you turn it back around? Well, I'll tell you with, with me, when you feel like shit, and, and I did go through a, a spell there where I did. I was pretty low and wasn't working out and all that. And, and you know, you look in the mirror, and maybe you don't look terrible, but, you know, I, I didn't have that pump I normally have. I wasn't quite as lean as I was several months before. And I give myself a couple seconds to feel sorry for myself, mm-hmm. and then I can snap myself right back out of it because I know that in six weeks I can be in the best shape of my life. And I know I can. And I just have to dedicate that time to training like I like I want and I can be right back to where I was and, and you know so this brings up another thing that I want to talk about and some people aren't gonna like this part of the conversation because it's about genetics and I've heard my entire life people saying well you're lucky because you've got good genetics and the question that I always ask and it doesn't mean I'm right but it's a legitimate question how much of my genetics is a commitment to health and fitness, a commitment that's lasted now 25 years. So we talk about the decisions we make. You know, our life is the byproduct of the decisions we make. So the decisions that I've made about my health, the food that I eat, training, everything that I've done consistently, no matter what, even through injury, for 25 years. So how much of my genetics, the way I look, is because I've just been blessed with good genes or is it because of my commitment, my dedication, my hard work, my consistency? Because when I hear someone say that it's genetics, to me it's pretty insulting. It is. It's really insulting. So then when someone says, well, look at me, you know, I'm overweight or I've got this health condition, I've got that health condition, I ask the same question. And you gotta ask yourself the same question and be honest with yourself about it. Maybe it's not always the case, but ask yourself how much of it is lifelong bad habits accumulated over a period of life. And then people say, well, look at my parents or look at my grandparents. But then you got to ask, did they live the same way? Did you learn those lifestyle habits from them? And that's where if I'm going to be lucky, if someone's going to say, hey, you're lucky, I'll say that where I was lucky is that I learned this early on in my life. That's where I was lucky because some people, I, I have to say, you know, they don't learn it until later on. And then they have to undo all those years of bad habits just to get to where I started. Well, and, for and so, example, yeah, like you were saying, considering yourself. So, so, so I, I would say that that's you know, that's that's where I see it. And look, you know, are there genetic factors? Yeah, look, I don't want to debate it back and forth, but look, you know, look at you know things like say diabetes. Mm-hmm. And someone says, well, hey, I've got diabetes. You know, the doctor diagnosed it. It runs in my family. But then turn to find out the person makes a lifestyle change, changes their diet and everything, and all of a sudden now their diabetes is manageable. Right. So again, how much of that is lifestyle? The diabetes runs in your family because nobody runs in your family. <laughs> That's a good one. Was, uh, was no, that the, a comment on there? No, no, no. Uh, you just came hey, up with that. To go back to how how you make it work, right? So, Dennis, it's a new year. Talk to me. Let's go. This is about right. Dennis now. I, I just want to know, what are your what are your, are your plans? I know you, you, you hit the goal that we talked about last yes. year. Yes, yes. Now, are you going to get back into the gym? Yes, you, I'm already back in the gym. You're back yes. in the gym. Last okay. week's, yes. So, this is how you make sure you get to the gym. Talk to day. me. What? What do I, and you know me better, you, know, you and James know me better than anyone. What do I like to do more... More than anything, more than even working out. What's the one thing we talk about all the time that I enjoy on TV? Oh, watching ESPN. Watching ESPN. Right. Right. College football especially. Right. Right. So this past year or the past, let's say, several months, I've watched less college football than I've watched my entire life. But I didn't stop working out. So 
there's definitely something that you that you do, you know, whether it's in the morning or at night for 45 minutes that you regularly do that you enjoy that you can sacrifice right in replace with the 45 minutes in the gym. And like sure, I would have loved to have watched the entire uh Georgia um Alabama Alabama game. game. Right. Or no, the Georgia um who did hell Oklahoma. I would love to watch the entire game. But I ate like shit over the weekend. I had to get my workout yesterday, so I only saw like the first half. So okay, yeah, that's it, what it, you do. You it sacrifice. Goes back, it goes back to, to priorities. Up. Yeah, yeah. And then we had a whole episode about that. Then that's kind of where where I was trying to ask I, you was on your one through five list. Mm-hmm. Where is fitness? Well, and that's that's what you got to ask yourself, right? And you got to write them out, and then be honest with yourself and say, okay, am I really being honest? Is to, am I really prioritizing fitness in my top five? Because I can tell you, it's one hundred percent in my top five. Mm-hmm. And look, my top five is my only five because there's, <laughs> there's nothing left. Five. Yeah. There's nothing left after yeah. five. Matter of fact, look, after being a dad, being a husband, being a business owner and fitness, there's not a lot left over. People wonder why like, I kind of dropped off YouTube and all that or why I've never really committed to social media, why I don't give a shit about Instagram because it's not a priority to me because there's just not enough of me left over. No. And I would say that Anyone who says they don't have time now, I'm going to ask you, like, how much time do you really waste on shit like social media? Because I look at the statistics on social media and it's nauseating. Like, it's crazy what a time suck it is. Yeah. And, you know, it's just like you get caught on this auto rewind. It's like you go through, you check your posts on Instagram and then you go to, you know, YouTube and then you go here and you go there and it's like, then repeat. It's so like, I'm surprised people get anything done. Hey, this, that's this, why I haven't been able to really grow social media. I mean, not that I have really even tried, but after family, work, training, there's really not much left for me. I don't have anything exciting to post. I'm a pretty boring dude. So those are the three things well, that are going to be posted. Well, that's the thing. Story. I would say that I'm, I'm not good at social media. And, it's, and I'm not good because I've never made it a priority. Like... Would I be as good as some of these people? I don't know. But I know that anytime I commit myself to something. Sure. Look, anytime anybody commits themselves to something and they do it over and over and they put a lot into it to master, you know, their craft or whatever it is they're doing, you're going to get good at it. It's just, you know, the amount of time that it takes. And anyone out there who wants to be a social media ambassador right now who thinks it's not work, you're fucking crazy. You're crazy. Like it requires dedication. It requires thought. You know, all these kids out there that want to be the next, you know, Jake Paul or or Luke Paul, you know, think these guys just fuck off all day and do YouTube videos. You're crazy. Think these guys how many, oh no, go ahead. Yeah, I mean look, these guys, that's their job. This is what they do. There's a reason that they're good at it. Think about how many things they've done that nobody's seen because they have you know, they're they're only gonna post the best stuff, right? So like their entire life is filming and taking pictures and doing this. What stuff. they do and, and brainstorming ideas right. and so, you know. Look, it just goes back to priorities. It's all about priorities. It's what's most important to you. You know, we talk a lot about balance is having balance, you know, between your career and your family and, you know, fitness. Is that most important? Okay, well, that's what you're going to pursue and you're going to be pretty good at each of those. If you want to be really, really good at one of those, you're going to end up making sacrifices. Like as much as I don't like to admit it, I'll tell you straight up that between trying to maintain my fitness trying to put everything that I put into BPI, have I been there as much as I wanted to be there as a dad and as a husband? No, not at all. It's not up even until this year that I've even taken a real vacation. This is the first time I've taken a week vacation. Like my honeymoon when I got married, it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Hmm. You know, that was my honeymoon because I was just deathly afraid to miss a day of work because of so much, you know, that we had going on every single day. It was just like every day... I felt like we lived in dog years. Every day was like seven days, crammed seven days worth of work into one day, every day. And you know what the the funny thing, so to answer your question, do I have that 45 minutes? Yeah, I don't, I really, I mean, there's a certain point where to me, I'm just like, I'm just a fucking head case, man. Like, you know me, I'm just. just, It's just not important enough to you. No, it's not. And to me, it's like, and I'll tell James, if I can get laid being funny and charming, (laughs) that's easy. That's easy for me. You know what I mean? Look, you've, you've gotten away with it without being mm. in shape like and if your only motivation for getting in shape is about getting girls and if you can get girls without being in shape then are you really going to be that motivated to do it probably not hey I had this. you got to find something that's meaningful but i do you. so so the couple of things i do i'm a very competitive guy and 
you know, I wrote down things like I'm going to join Chris's lacrosse league. Good, you're an to, athlete. To you do need that. to take advantage. That's of that. the thing. That's like cool. I've, but the thing was, and 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 that was another thing. I let my injury. I was playing. I was playing sports at Florida State. I was playing lacrosse at Florida State. Played high school lacrosse. The minute I got injured, and I realized like I don't have to be at this high level of six o'clock every day. I just stopped. This was at 22 years old. Mm-hmm. It was just like I didn't. So a lot of and I, I never. It never took me to the point where. Like, I, re- I re- resented it a little bit, the fitness of it. I just dedicated so much to me, and at the end, it didn't give me anything. So, so here's what I would say. And this is the cool thing about the time that we're in right now. Fitness doesn't have to look one way. It's not just about going into the gym and lifting free weights and then jumping on, you know, an elliptical and doing 30 minutes of cardio and eating chicken breasts and, you know, brown rice every day. It doesn't have to look like that. It really comes down to, again... How much of it is a priority to you? How? What kind of results do you want? If you just kind of want to feel better and look better, well, then isn't going and playing lacrosse or going out for a run or doing whatever you want to do that's physical activity, isn't that still working out? So it just comes yeah. down to you put in the amount of effort that it takes to get the result you want. So if you don't want the extreme results and if you're not willing to put the extreme amount of energy into it, then don't. And that's my point about not trying to cram a square peg into a round hole. Just really decide what you're willing to commit to it. And, and not, not just results, because a lot right. of people will tell you, hey, I want the crazy results. I want shredded six pack abs, but I don't really want to work out that hard and I don't want to, you know, eat that clean. And I'm going right. to tell you, then you're shit out of luck. You know, so be honest, be real with yourself. And that's where I think social media people need to fucking be a little more real and say, hey, yeah, I look this way, but I work my ass off for it. Yep. It doesn't come easy. It comes at a sacrifice, you know. I'm just, I don't get to go hang out with my friends. I don't get to go out and eat chicken wings and drink beer and, you know, fucking watch the game. And 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 to to bring up that, I mean, like there's a point where like I was just talking to Whitney about it. He said I hit I hit my fitness goal last year. His and it was goal. it was to the point where You hit yours? There was a no, I hit mine, but it was to the point where we're talking about now. I didn't find a motivation. My motivation to myself was to scare myself, was to get to a point where there was a time when I was working out with Whitney for, I think, three weeks before you had three the weeks. baby and you had to go. No, three, no, it was before I got injured. Before No, before you before you hit the baby. Before that, I was with you for a while, oh, that, but yeah, before yeah, the then baby. Came, then you came back. Then, we right. came, yep. then I started working out with him, and I was doing great. And I hit such a groove. I was lifting heavy. I was feeling great afterwards. I was eating good and everything. And then Whitney left for a little bit. He, you know, he was I abandoned then, you. He abandoned me, right? And it's to the point where it scared me not to the point where – um, I was like, damn, I'm, I'm, I'm lost without it. But there was a point where it's like, there's right now at this point, I can't do this without Whitney. See, see, but that's because the motivation wasn't coming from you. Whitney was driving it. Right. Absolutely. And and I'm looking at Mike right now. Mike's behind the camera over there because Mike, Mike can relate to this. When right. we did games to gains, Mike got in shape, but he also knew that I was behind him whipping his ass all the time. And then it reaches that point where. I got tired of doing it and said, okay, time to pass the baton. It's up to you. And I'd say that, you know, Mike and I have never talked about this, but I think that was the struggle is to find that from within himself, you know, find a reason to continue at that level because it takes a lot to push yourself that hard. You know, some people, you know, have developed that kind of self-discipline and a lot of people just say, well, I'm not that self-discipline. I say, sure you are in the things that you want to do that are important enough to you to do. And so, again, not to beat a dead horse, but it comes back to fucking priorities, how important it is to you. So if you want to get great results, make it important. Make it something not just that you should do or want to do, but that you must do, that you right. will do no matter what. Right. So my tactic was to scare the hell out of myself. Did With you? reaching a, I scare the hell out of myself. Once you see that, that you, certain... You didn't scare yourself enough because when Whitney was gone, you were gone. But now I'm saying, like, from this point, so... This was last week. Right? This was oh, last this was week. last week. This was last week. Oh, right. so this, this, this is a this new, is new motivation. This is a new motivation. So, so how are you scaring yourself? Hitting a weight that I want to see for one time in my life and never hit that are you again. Gonna, are you going to say it? I, I nah, just, I'll tell James. You're minute. saying you're, you want to get fatter than you've ever gotten? No, I wanted to hit it. I wanted to hit it once to be like, okay, let's make sure we never get to this level again, right? So that was my motivation. Once I saw that, I was like, whew, okay. So you're saying you got heavier than you've ever gotten? Yes. Been. Yes. Okay, because you said no when I said fatter than you've ever gotten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, I, I consider it wasn't fat, it was muscle. It was, <laughs> it was really dense and strong muscle. Does a muscle weigh more than fat anyway? No, but speaking of uh, some motivation, so I just there's this awesome uh, report. So this poker player, very overweight p- poker player guy, was about 35% body fat. 
His buddy, who's another poker player, bet him a million dollars that he couldn't get below 10% body fat. And he did. Wow. $7,000 for every pound he got. Jeez. And he lost like 70 pounds See, or something but he, like that. You know, obviously he had a strong You give me a million dollars, I guarantee you I look better than Whitney. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> well, screw it. But, but what I'm saying is, but but to me, look, so the best shape that I ever got into here. Split it with me, I'll train you. Was where, yeah, was the best shape I ever got into here when we did the competition here. Well, it was the same thing. Uh, a couple of people in the building, the, actually the person who won it. Bill, oh, right. yeah. It, you know, I think that, you know, going back and looking at it, I think getting shape meant nothing to him. I think he just embraced the challenge and because he's very methodical about how he approaches things and very committed, like when he commits himself, he does it and he right. does it right. And he got the results because he was just very systematic about it. Right. And that's where the results come from is just like if you can find it within yourself to just be consistent, just go in and do it. And the more effort you can put into it, obviously, the better results you're going to get. But if you can just do it without fucking it up, like without being your own worst enemy, without getting in your own way, you're going to get results. For sure. And I mean, that was 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 a competition of it all. And me, to me, I like proving people wrong. You know what I mean? To a certain point, but there also has to be a motivation factor to that as well. Well, it's it's got to be something internal. You know, proving other people wrong can be a good motivator, but I'd still say that's external. It's right. got to be something that's more personally meaningful to you and coming from a better place. Yeah, it's got to be, you got to be accountable to yourself. You, there has to be something inside of you, like, you don't want to let yourself down. You know, yeah. like, I've, you know, I've got to do this. So, like, can't put that on anyone else. Yeah, I'm trying to find, I mean, like, look, to me, January, you're hitting that age now. Where they tell you, look, bro, there's a certain point where you're not going to be able to bounce back. How old are you? 31. Okay. So I feel I still have what it takes that I could muster up that three and a half star athlete somewhere. Michael Hearn is 48. Okay. (laughs) You're not even close. But but Michael Hearn's an alien, too. (laughs) He might be from outer space. I mean, look, Witt and I talk about it. You know, Mike is one of those people. I would say that. After working out as long as we have, as consistently as we have, as hard as we have, and considering that we both feel we probably have at least a good aptitude for it, yep. if not good genetics for it, Michael Hearn's on a different level. There's no it, way to describe it. No, nah, it's just a different level. I mean, look, it, anybody can say what they want to say about him. I just know that that's just, there's another level, and it's another level of commitment, another mm-hmm. level of intensity, of hard work. I mean, just the guy, the way the guy lives his life, you know. First of all, who do you know that trains at four in the morning every day? It's one thing for some of us to muster it once in a while, to do it every day, to eat the way he eats. I mean, it's just a lifelong commitment. And the guy, you know, it's a pursuit for him. Is it an extreme? Fuck yeah, it's oh, yeah. an extreme. But he has extreme results, though. Like, he I mean, does. that's how you look like that. And that's, he is one big extreme yeah, result. Absolutely. He is. And you know what? But he also. I think he loves it. That's why oh, he yeah. does it. He loves it. And he, you know, so for him, it's not a sacrifice. It's not miserable. That's the, the life he, he enjoys living. But yeah, I mean, anytime I think that I'm super committed and been doing this a long time, I look at him and I just go, Pfft. another level. That's like <laughs> saying that that's like having a hundred million dollars in, in the bank and you're living in a mansion and driving a Ferrari and, you know, and then. There's the guy who's got, you know, the 300-foot yacht who's, you know, the multi-billionaire. It's just yeah. another level. Yeah. Yeah. Another level. I think we only have a few more minutes left of camera space. We actually burnt through the film, which is cool. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, great conversation, guys. I think Whitney's going to definitely be a regular on the show. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I think after doing it as long as, as Whitney has and experiencing the successes that Whitney has. It's not like just someone who's, you know, in the pursuit of, of doing something with their f- fitness career. I think that, you know, the things that you've accomplished are most people's aspirations, not just the magazine covers and the relationships that you have in the industry. But, you know, I mean, look, you do what you love every day. You work in the fitness industry. You've made this your career. Yeah. And so you've experienced the highs, but you're also a real dude and you know what the lows are and you know, and real enough to have real conversations about it and share it with people. And, and that's my goal is just to paint a, a more honest, real picture so people can manage their expectations better and not feel disappointed and try to measure up to other people that are living a bullshit facade life. And I think, you know, 
Whitney's also a, a testament of a guy who wanted to be in the fitness industry, climbed all the way, climbing to the top of the industry now as our national sales manager. But he did it. He did it the old traditional way. You know, started off as a fitness model. Did yeah, that I, way, but and I had no intention, you know, when I started shooting that it was going to turn into this. But I used to always, and I and I should get back to doing it. And it's the old cliche of writing down the goals and everything. Mm-hmm. And I used to do this all the time. And I have the old book, and I look at it from time to time. And uh, once I started shooting for the magazines, and I knew I wanted to be in this industry, but I didn't know how. And back then, it was like trying to get a sponsorship. But the, you know, that before social media, I didn't even know how to get in touch with these companies. You know, I look up in magazines and try to get their addresses, maybe Yellow email book. them. Yeah. But I always said to myself that I wanted to parlay this into business somehow. And then that you, you've done. Yeah. And you, and then you get wrapped up in, into your, you know, your daily routine in your life and you're, you're, you know, moving along. And then all of a sudden you reflect back and I'm sitting here now like thinking, shit, I did it. That's exactly what I intended on doing. And I'm here right now. Yeah. Would you give a couple of pieces of advice to somebody trying to break in? Now it's, with, I guess, with the social media. You know, it's so different now because it's a social media thing and, and that's not really, you know, my angle wasn't social media. Um, but like, for example, if you wanted to work for a supplement company, what are... Working what are, for a supplement company, for one, don't make bodybuilding the most important thing in your life. A lot of people call us, all, you know, they'll call us for jobs true. or for like interviewing people and they say, oh, I'm a competitor. I have this show coming up. At, and that's great. Awesome. Congratulations. I hope you do extremely well. But that can't be your priority if you're going to work for a major uh, supplement company. You can't be so focused on bodybuilding as opposed to the, it, to the You hear that word industry. again, priority. You know, yeah. if that's what you want to do, you want to be in this industry, then make it a priority and you know, figure out, make it, do an assessment. Where are you at now? Where do you want to be? And what are some steps that you can create in between? Like I always envision, you know, like Super Mario Brothers. It's like, you know, if you want to, you know, go from the bottom level to the top level and you're jumping on these like moving little steps, that's, that's everything, right? It's like, you know, what are those steps? And usually they are moving by the way, mm-hmm. but what are those steps to get from where you are now to where you want to be? And so, you know, just getting in the fitness industry, the likelihood of calling up a supplement company and saying, hey, I'd like to come work for you guys, eh, probably 0% chance of that. But, you know, go out and, you know, start doing something. Network. Network, I mean, build some relationships. The way I did it, I got a job in sales first. Then I went and got a job in sales in sports nutrition. So it's just like, but if you have no sales experience, how are you gonna go be a salesperson for a right. sports nutrition company? Right, yep. All right, I think we're, Pretty much wrapped up. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the James Grace Theory. We always say hey, this is the best episode yet, but this is probably going to be our most real episode. Zero notes. Fun. And uh, Whitney Reed Fit underscore 33 Correct. is the Instagram. Um, we'll throw that out a couple times. Um, and James is probably going to do a little video for you guys when we drop this next week for the highlights on YouTube. And... That's a, big, that's a big thing, you know, now multiple platforms of these conversations. So obviously here on IG Live, available a shortened version, abbreviated version on YouTube. And now that we've got jamesgrage.com almost up and running, we'll have them there. We'll be and, on Stitch, yeah. Apple, iTunes, uh, Google Play, Spotify, anywhere you guys can get podcasts, the James Grage Theory will be talking on there. Talking about so real start, shit. Yeah, talk, just, just trying yeah, to talk guys, about This was great. Please have me back. Cool. You'll, be, you'll be one fun. of the fixtures, man. This was actually awesome, fun, and easy. So thank you guys again. We'll catch up soon.